Hey everyone, in this video, we're going to learn how to do logging and testing. Now, this might not be the most interesting topic you want to talk about when writing Solana programs. You probably want to write stuff and not test your stuff. But as a professional software developer, you should know how to debug your own code and write tests for it so that it doesn't cause any regressions. A quick introduction, my name is Josh, and my mission is to accelerate the world's transition to blockchain technology, whether that's Solana, Ethereum, Cardano, Bitcoin, or whatever. So as always, disclaimer, this time it is development advice. You should test your code. It's very important. Moving on, this video is sponsored by myself because no one else will sponsor me. For those new to the channel, this video is one of many in a series of salon development. I try to reduce the dependencies of each video on each other, but inevitably that's not gonna happen. So if there's any information that you feel like there's missing, do check out the playlist. Now let's actually get started. First thing with working with Solana is you should know how to log. Unfortunately, there's no debugger support. Uh, that's fortunate. I looked into it. So the best we got is logging, which by the way, from my own personal experience with other smart contracts, um, the, uh, just, just even be able to log on the on-chain code is actually pretty amazing by itself. So in Solana, you can't use your normal Rust println statement. Instead, you have to use a new macro that Solana introduces called message. It works exactly like a println. If, if you look at this picture, you just call the macro, the message macro, you give it your string and then use the braces to include the variable that you want to print out. So exactly like Berlin. Now, the only tricky part is once you are running your code, you need to run this Solana logs command to, on a separate terminal, which then will uh, show the logs that are, are made when you interact with the program as you can see in this stream right here. Uh, you can see right here on this program log, greeted 100 times, that is from this actual line of code. So let's just go through a quick example of that. All right, so in our code, uh, for, let's let's say we wanna add some new messages in, inside our process instruction function. Well, we already have one, so we don't need to import the message, but if you look, we import the message from our Solana program library over here. So using this macro is straightforward. It's the same as using a println, but let's say here we want to print out the value of our instruction data. You know, maybe you were curious from the previous video on what we're actually sending across the network. And just like a println, if we were processing a non-primitive variable types like a, a array or a enum, like we will soon get, we need to use the colon question mark symbol. And we just pass in our instruction data. And if we're curious on what instruction enum we get back, we can also print that out. Okay, so now that we have our code, um, we need to do a couple things. I already started some of the process earlier, but we need to start our Solana validator by doing Solana test validator. This will deploy our node so we can, so our client can talk to the smart contract that we write. And now that we've changed our code, we need to deploy it. So uh, we can just run. Uh, npm run build program rust. This will build our code first. And then once it's built and we generate the binaries, we can deploy it on our network. And then once all of this is done, now if we want to actually see the logs that we are making, we just use Solana logs. And this will start a stream for our tra any transaction that's made on the network. Because as of right now, nothing is being made. So the next thing we need to do is we need to do npm run start. This will run our front end code to send a transaction to the network. And we see this is successful. And we go back to our Solana logs. You can see that we are printing out the data that we set. So this is our instruction data that we're sending uh, two and 100, zero, zero, zero. This is just our value of 100 in little Indian format. Wouldn't worry about it too much. And you can see that the instruction we get back, the enum we get back is a set of value 100. So hopefully nothing too surprising if you've seen the previous video. And that's really about it. If I run more NPM starts, you can see that the transaction will appear more often. See, there's the second one. So pretty nifty stuff. Unfortunately, there isn't a debugger, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, that would be great to actually walk through the code line by line. But so this is the best we have. However, that is not the best thing we can do. However, luckily for us, we can write tests. So let's talk about testing. All right. 
So what are the benefits of testing? There are the typical benefits of writing tests that all good soft developers should know. Uh, you catch bugs early and this is very important because it saves time and money. Imagine if your code, your broken code gets deployed on the network on production and then so clients discover it. Then you have to roll back the code and all sorts of things involved. Uh, it's better just to catch it early. Now, so from a development perspective, if you're making a large change, it also gives you confidence in your change. If there, if you have a whole suite of tests backing you up, you know that if none of those tests fails, that your code is more likely to be correct. However, I understand we're all script kiddies. We want to just write code and get things done. The most important thing about writing tests, in my opinion, on Solana is that it's just a very easy way to test Solana programs. You saw earlier when I was doing my log, with all the process involved in actually testing our code manually, I had to change the code, build the code, deploy the code on the network, and then write the front end code. With tests, we don't really need to do that. We can just take the function that we want to test, give it the parameter that we expect to give it, and then see what the results are and confirm that the results are what we expect it to be, which is especially faster than writing your front end code to send the transaction. If all you have is the on-chain code uh, for now and not this example, which already has a front end implemented for you. So how do you write a test? So here's the anatomy of a test. Uh, it's exactly the same as writing a rust test. Uh, you define a module which you can see over here by the zero. And this module will include all the tests that you want to write. And you can also add imports that you want to use in your tests. You'll see some of this in the Solana program that we will go over. And then uh, inside our module that we create, we want to define the individual test cases. We can use the hashtag uh, test annotation to mark uh, the function we write to be a test. And we can have multiple tests in a module, uh, just to be clear. And finally, we just implement our tests. Uh, in this case, we have multiple assert ma macros that we can use. Um, I, I know I put down two, but there's actually three. Uh, there's a normal assert, uh, which just re takes in a Boolean, whether something is true or false. If it's true, it's fine. If it's false, you have an error. There's assert equal, which checks two variables that you pass it and make sure that they're the same. And it's opposite, assert not equal, and we, which is where we get two variables and just make sure that they are not the same. Now, another thing that we're, I'm gonna show is there's a also a there's also a functionality to check for errors. We should it's the should panic annotation, and what it does is if your function that you run throws an error, then it, instead of failing the test, it would pass the test because that's what it was expected. And that's it for writing tests. So let's update our existing test from the hello world example to support the new custom instruction that we're sending over the network. All right, so back in our test code, let's just drop all of our terminals. We're going to write our test. So in the hello world example, there are two locations where there are tests. The first location is in the main lib RS. If you scroll down, you'll see uh, our test module, which has already been defined. And there's already a test that's implemented for us. Um, right now it doesn't work. We need to adjust it to use our new custom instruction. But before we do that, I also want to point out, and this had me confused for a while, uh, if you look inside our bro folder, there's another folder called tests, and inside of that, there's another librs file, and that has a, another test that uses the Solana program test helper library. We're not going to worry about that. Um, we're just going to focus on just calling the code that we implement directly and just use that. And just for the sake of ease, uh, I'm just going to delete this file. So let's quickly go over what's inside this test. So first, like I mentioned earlier, we have our module test, and this is where we implement our test. Inside the module, we import our super colon colon star. And what this is, is it is referring to our main code right here in this one file. Specifically, it allows us to access the function process instruction, which is what we'll be testing. Alongside of that, we will also implement a epoch and mem, and these are just libraries that help us generate the files we need to run our tests. We only have one test in this code, and that's test sanity. Um, it, it does a basic process instruction test, which you can see right here on line 101, where you give it data and you just assert to see if the value or the calendar specifically is what it should be. So pretty straightforward. The first thing we need to do is we actually need to create the account. And so that's what all the code from line 76 to 90 is. Um, I won't go into all of the details of this. This will mostly be a copy and paste operation from this code, 
To create a new account info, and remember account info is the class that represents the account that we store in our uh, network. And it takes in these, oh gosh, I don't even know, seven, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, eight uh, parameters. If we are curious, we can do a quick look on account info. And I might just do that. Account info Solana. And see the Solana program, there's account info definition. You go to account info. We can see that they ha it has uh, eight fields. And these are the fields that we are populating. And that's all it is. We're just going to fill it in. All of this is pretty straightforward. The only one item that I want to point out to is the data. The data has to be a very specific number. Specifically, it has to be the it has to be a, a vector. Uh, this vec, by the way, is a macro that creates a vector, which is a dynamic array. But it creates a array of elements that is the size of a U32, and we populate it with zero. Specifically, what this U32 is is if you go all the way to the greetings account for that we use in our data, which is right here, we have a U32 for the counter. So if there were multiple fields, for example, if we had you know another counter two that's U16, we just need to go back to our test over here and just append a mem size of a U16 and just add that up our 32 to get the correct size. Now we don't have any of that, so I will just undo everything. So once we have that, we need to get our instruction data, which if you recall, when our process, what our process instruction takes is a U8. And what the test here does is it just creates an empty array that doesn't do anything and we just pass it in because remember in the original Hello World example, we don't use the instruction data. We're going to fix that in this video, but just going over the code. And so we need to pass in the list of accounts that we have. Um, we just create a another vector with the account that we just created up here. And then finally, we can actually start running our tests. The first thing we do is we, given the list of accounts that we have, we just check to see if the account that we just created has a counter of zero, which is indeed what happens here because the default value is zero. So nothing too interesting there. The interesting part starts from when we call the process instruction. This process instruction is mapped directly to the process instruction function that we have that, well, process our instruction. And this is how we execute and test our code. So the three parameters that the process instruction takes in is the program ID, our list of accounts, and the instruction data. In the original code, the program only increments the counter. So after the first time, our counter would be incremented to one. And then after we run it a second time, it gets incremented to be two. So pretty straightforward. I don't think there's anything too confusing. So let's actually modify this test to match our new uh, custom instruction. So to save time for everybody, I'm just going to copy and paste. So instead of having this instruction data vector, we're going to create a array. This is a example for a set up a, a hello world set operation. Remember we have increment, decrement, and set. And if we recall from our previous video, what how we represent this instruction data, a if we have an array of the first value is zero, that is a increment. If we had a array of first index have, having the value one, that's a decrement. And then if we have a array of the first index being a two, that's a set operation. But then we add additional data, the index one through five, one through four of the array is mapped to a U32 value in specifically little Indian format so that we can uh, use that value to set to our counter. And if you want more clarification on that, go watch the previous video. Um, there's a section that I just talked about Little Indian and how we're um, setting the set data. So with that aside, uh, we create an array. I just I called it array two. Um, probably could call it array. Doesn't really matter. So the interesting thing of how we get this data is um, in the client side from the previous video, we had to use a buffer layout class to convert specific uh, data types to be a uh, byte array. In this instance. I'm sure there are multiple ways of doing it, but I'm just going with the simplest thing I could think of and just create an array and then populate it with the byte data. The first index of our array is very straightforward. If we have this, it's either just a zero, a one, or a two. More interesting is how do we represent the next U32 bits? And how I decide to do this is manually put the value in. So if we saw earlier when we ran the logging code, we had a 
100, 0, 0, 0, which represents the value 100. And to do that, and specifically to get the byte array for that, the u32 parameter has a helpful helper function called uh, two little Indian bytes. And what it does is it returns an array of size four, uh, specifically with each value being a u8. So essentially it just converts this 100 to a uh, array of u8, which will be used to populate our instruction data. Um, speaking of instruction data, this is where we first define it. And what this code does is it creates an array uh, with five with a length of five and each value set to be two. And mirror two is specifically our set command. So I just used a for loop from uh, index zero to four. And what I did was over here, inside instruction data, starting from i plus one, because remember we, we want to keep the first value to be our, our, our instruction. We want to start from the second value, which is index one. So from index one to four, we're just mapping the array value from the array that we generated from the little Indian, which is from index zero to four, and we're just populating it in. So specifically, we will create this, uh, this specific array in the comp. And so now that we finally have our instruction data, we, we can finally send it across the network. Um, we, we will keep the same uh, example where we create the account, but then over here, we can start using the instruction data uh, for our process instruction. And what we'll get over here is we'll have a counter of 100. Now, uh, to make things interesting, we can set another value for our instruction data and we can do an increment. So let's just copy this and let's say we set this to be zero. And then we put this in. Our expected value now is 100 plus one. So it'll be 101. And that should be it. So let's give this a run. So to run our tests, if we don't know the command, just go to package.json. And you can see that right here, there's this uh, test command that we can run. And all it does is it just calls a normal cargo test on the our, our Rust program. So we can do npm run test program Rust. And we can run the test and then everything is correct, it should pass. Okay, great, and now it's finished. So as you can see, our test result is successful. All right, so that's that. Um, what's interesting is that there are errors, and here's a great error that we can look at right now. If, let's say we do a decrement, and this is an interesting bug that I didn't think about until I actually ran a test, and this will actually cause the code to fail as you see right here. And you'll see that the error is um, panicked at attempt to subtract with overflow. So initially I thought, why would this fail? It just should just return negative one. After some thinking, I realized the reason is because it's a unsigned integer of 32 bits, which means that it cannot be negative. All the values has to be uh, positive. So that's why it crashes. But on that topic, if we actually look inside uh, above, we can see the messages that are being printed on the console. So this can be helpful for our debugging purposes. So that's an interesting problem. And maybe that's another test case that we should try and cover. So I'm just going to put this back to two and we can create another test. And we can just copy everything here in test sanity and just make another test. I'll just get rid of most, get rid of this and We'll keep all the account information set up. And the only thing we want to change is, let's just change this to be a one. And this will cause it to crash once we call process instruction. And that's okay because we're expecting that. So what we should do is we add the should panic attribute to our test. And we'll call this test crash, for example. All right, so let's give this a try again. Let's run the code again. And there we go. Now we run two tests, test sanity, and it passes. And then test crash, which panics, and it did. So it passes. And that's about it for writing tests. So probably pretty straightforward, but these are some helpful things that you, any developer should add to their tool set to make sure that they're writing proper uh, smart contract code. Hopefully the video is not too long. We'll find out once we start editing. But that's about it. If you found this video helpful, I would greatly appreciate it if you give this video a, a like and a sub. Otherwise, uh, stay tuned for our next video. I most likely be about uh, using the Anchor library, which will help do all the serialization and deserialization of our account information and instruction data so we don't have to manually manage the bytes itself. But until then, I will catch you all later.